So good evening, my name is Josh Morris, and I'm gonna to talk to you this evening about how my family has been living off-grid for the past 10 years. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, well, this poor family, they probably live in a cave somewhere. But in reality, we live in what I like to think of as a homestead of the future. It is a 100% solar and wind-powered home and farm that's designed to restore environmental abundance and stability. You see, our current society really depends almost entirely upon the extraction of finite resources to include petroleum, soil nutrients, and even fresh water supplies. This will lead eventually to a world of resource scarcity and conflict. That is why this evening I would like to share with you all a solution that I believe has been largely overlooked. It's a solution in which small farms play an important role to restore the balance of farm ecosystems, restore the health of the soil, and even restore, restore the role of humans as stewards of the planet. My interest in resource issues and resource scarcity began just after high school. I had the opportunity to visit about 25 different countries over the course of 15 years. But you see, my worldwide tour wasn't exactly a vacation. Instead, I was serving with the United States military. And the places that I visited weren't exactly vacation spots. They were struggling desperately with poverty, malnutrition, lack of education, and political corruption. But the one common thread that I found in all of these places was an acute scarcity of critical resources. I also learned during all of these deployments that the greater the resource scarcity in any area, the more likely that we would find violent conflict. The greater the scarcity, the more intense the conflict would be. Well, I eventually left the military, but while I was in college in 2010, the war in Syria really caught my attention. I noticed that there was a common misconception that this was just another war caused by ethnic tensions, religious ideology, and political incompetence. While these factors all played an important role, I knew that resource scarcity would be part of one of the root causes. In fact, Digging just a little deeper, I found that Syria had endured a huge agricultural crisis that led up to the war. You see, back in the 1980s, the Syrian government embarked upon an ambitious program of agricultural modernization. And according to data from Benjamin Cook of NASA, the Syrian aquifer was pumped for irrigation at such a rate that it was lowered by six meters each year, starting in 1985. Well, Syrian agriculture boomed, and the population in that country nearly tripled within 30 years. But in some areas, the aquifer began to run dry. And in 2006, a drought struck that lasted for five years. In those five years, 75% of all Syrian farms failed, and 85% of the livestock in that country perished or were destroyed. So imagine if that happened in this country. Imagine being one of those farmers trying to feed your family. Now the problem with Syria is that it's not really an isolated incident. If we look at conflicts around the world, we find that resource scarcity is on the rise globally. This very serious issue motivated me to complete my master's degree in geological engineering right here at Missouri S&T in 2012. What I learned here was fascinating, but also quite frightening. You see, our current global society depends upon resource extraction in the same way that Syrian agriculture 
depended upon the extraction of a finite water resource. Now, if we look at a timeline of the human population versus resource extraction, we quickly notice that as our human population is set to hit 10 billion by the year 2050, our critical resources that we rely on will begin to decline. In fact, according to experts at Cambridge Energy Research Associates, our supply of petroleum will begin to drop off sometime between the years 2050 and 2060. Among other resource shortages, I would like to highlight our consumption of mined phosphorus. You see, phosphorus is a critical mineral nutrient that is necessary to grow nearly all of our food using industrial agriculture. But according to many experts, including Professor Stuart White of the University of Technology, Sydney, U.S. reserves of phosphorus will begin to decline within the next 10 years. And global phosphorus reserves will sharply decline sometime around the year 2075 after having already plateaued in mid-century. What all of these experts are trying to tell us should serve as a dire warning that we must change course immediately. We must change the way that we produce food and energy to avoid handing our children a world of scarcity, even starvation, and brutal conflict. This predicament is what motivated my wife and I to purchase our first 40 acres of land right here in the Ozarks 10 years ago this year with the intention of creating a sustainable farm. Now, the land that we purchased, the only land we could afford at the time was steep and rugged and highly eroded. The previous occupants had basically depleted the soil nutrients and left 50 years prior. Our neighbors would sort of laugh and even make bets with each other about how quickly we would just give up and go away. Uh, but we're still here. We were determined. Hello, neighbors. Uh, <laughs> but my wife and I did realize that sustainable and organic farming wouldn't quite be enough. We would have to undertake what I have begun to call restorative agriculture. Under restorative agriculture, we would have to restore the balance of vegetation, the farm ecosystem, and the health of the soil. We began this huge task by removing invasive species of vegetation and replacing those with a native warm season grass prairie. This includes not only several types of native grasses, but 18 different species of native wildflowers. These native plants have root systems that reach as deep as four meters, making them resistant to even the most extreme droughts. They don't even need phosphorus fertilizer because their roots are deep enough to extract those nutrients from deep within the soil. We also planted legumes such as clover, which fix the nitrogen from the air into the soil, completely eliminating the need for chemical fertilizers in those fields. This is what restorative agriculture looks like. Our next step was to restore the role of livestock in the farm ecosystem. You see, animals provide a key part of the nutrient and nitrogen cycle. They consume the vegetation, and they turn that into a nutrient-rich manure compost, which then builds the soil and allows that vegetation to flourish again. By rotating multiple species on our farm to include bison, cattle, goats, and poultry, we have ensured that all the vegetation is utilized in a balanced manner. This means that chemical herbicides have never been used on the farm. This is what restorative agriculture can do for small farms everywhere. We wanted to go one step further, so we decided to plant a three-acre food forest 
containing 10 types of edible fruits, nuts, and berries. Now, the food forest is managed by a flock of chickens. Now, this flock of chickens, they do eliminate all the pests, and they leave behind a nice, phosphorus-rich manure fertilizer for the plants. They also, by the way, produce some of the best eggs you could ever imagine. This is what restorative agriculture looks like. This is what it can do for a marginalized farm with depleted soil anywhere. My wife and I felt that a homestead of the future, a farm of the future, shouldn't consume energy. Instead, it should produce energy. And that's why we've been off the grid for 10 years. We achieved this by designing a home that was partially earth sheltered and built mainly out of insulated concrete forms with a passive solar orientation. That means that it's easy to heat and cool. And our 3,900 watt solar panel array provides plenty of electricity for lighting, small appliances, refrigeration, and even a small air conditioner and power tools when necessary. Our water needs are met by a 60 foot tall water pumping windmill that our Amish neighbors helped us install. Most of the barns and outbuildings on the farm are built mainly from lumber that's, that has been sustainably milled in our woodlot right on the farm. This is what restorative agriculture and restorative living can accomplish for any small farm. We accomplished most of this by using combinations of old homesteading techniques, such as windmills and pasture rotation, and combining those with new innovations, like solar panels and more efficient building materials. So in the past 50 years, this land had produced almost nothing. But just last year, our farm produced over $30,000 worth of food, electricity, and other necessities for our family and for others. Remember that, remember that scary timeline of resource depletion that I showed earlier? Critical shortages of petroleum, phosphorus, and fresh water will occur at least by mid-century. And one option is to continue on down that path of consumption, depletion, scarcity, and eventual brutal conflict. But what if we chose another path? What if we decided that we would all become part of the solution instead of part of the problem? What if we decided today that we would support our local small farms? What if we decided that we would shop at the farmer's market? Even restaurants and supermarkets could get their food from local small farms. What if some of you here resolved today that you would maybe install a beehive in your backyard or even poultry? What if you decided to build a raised bed garden or a greenhouse? What if we were to take some of our unused spaces, say, get rid of that golf course and put a wind farm there or solar panels? Well, I'm going to tell you it's hard work. You might have to spend less time on your cell phone. And you probably should just throw away your television. Your kid's PlayStation, that should go straight out the window. I'm just kidding, because those items can be recycled, of course. <laughs> but seriously, what if all of us here today decided that we were going to take part in restorative agriculture, either directly or indirectly, by supporting small farms? And what if we could do all of these things before a crisis forces us to change? Well, that would create a bright future indeed. That would create a world which you could be proud to hand to your children and your grandchildren. That would be a world in which small farms could help restore the balance of farm ecosystems, the balance of vegetation, the health of the soil, and even restore the proper role of humans as caretakers and stewards of the earth.
Thank you very much.